very pleased today to have Leslie Gilwing, who's a professor at ECS in computer science and AI at MIT. She was previously on the faculty at Brown. Correct me if I get anything wrong. Yeah. Make anything up. Um, she was she got her PhD in Stanford, Stanford from Neil Nielsen. Leslie is my little bit my cue card. She's regarded as a leading expert in machine learning, robotics, AI in particular, uh, and has made several contributions to decision making under uncertainty. MVPs, OMVPs, RL. Uh, in my view, she's particularly well known for the ability to integrate these contributions to solve challenging problems in, among other things, robotics, specifically sensing and uh, manipulation. Leslie is a AAAI fellow. She's a recipient of the Hitchcock Computer Thought Reward Award, joining a short list of people that are seen as pioneers in AI. She's in as a uh, president of faculty fellow, founding editor in chief of JMLR. So today she's going to tell us about uh, intelligent robot freedoms, how we can integrate again capabilities in, in planning, probabilistic reasoning, perception to solve challenging problems or mold manipulation. Thanks. Cool. All right. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. Um, let me say that uh, I really enjoy questions and back talk. I shouldn't say that with David in the room, but it's true. So uh, so please. <laughs> Feel free to interrupt, ask questions, whatever. Uh, that'll make it more fun for everybody. Um, so, so right. So, uh, so here's the thing, right? So imagine that you had a robot and you had this kitchen and you had to, uh, oh, clean it up or make dinner. Or something. It's not my kitchen. So, so I'm interested in 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 AI, uh, but I think about AI in the context of robots partly because. I think that there are some special questions at the interface of AI and robotics that, are, that I care about. And partly because it kind of it keeps me honest, I think it keeps me from making approximations about the world that I might make if I wasn't kind of tied to this particular problem to try to think about. So the question is, how do I get a robot to address this problem? And uh, I have a kind of an opening stick here. Uh, so one thing that's interesting is that uh, early, in AI and robotics, the two fields were quite close. People worked on, uh, when they worked on robotics, they were really thinking about often robots, generally intelligent robots. And if you haven't read the shaky tech report, I encourage you to, because it has logic and probabilistic reasoning and, and good motion planning stuff and all kinds of things. Uh, and it's, it's actually kind of, it, it's, a, it's embarrassing, I think, sometimes to read that tech report because they were so far out on the edge on so many things, and um, we kind of dropped the ball. Uh, and what's happened, I would say, is that we've that we've fragmented totally. So I just I I, I got a set of like titles of, of, of sessions at a robotics conference, a set of titles of sessions in an AI conference, and everybody is now down their little rabbit hole doing their thing, and it's like it's good stuff, and it's maybe more respectable in certain kinds of ways than what AI people used to do. More well quantified, there are more graphs and more theorems in the papers, and that's all good. But I think that we are not collectively as a field working together very well to try to actually address bigger questions. Um, so I think we can try to put stuff back together. I think that. Uh, so robot hardware has gotten better. You could say, oh, this hardware is not so good, and it's true in a sense, but the hardware is perfectly good enough to do all kinds of really interesting things, and we software people are the are the bottleneck. It's not a hardware problem anymore. It's a software problem. So here's a robot, perfectly capable robot. It's got computers. We don't know what programs to put in the computers, so that's what we have to do. We figured out a bunch of algorithmic pieces in the meantime. We know about more about learning. We know more about uncertain reasoning. We know more about we can you know very efficiently get uh, depth maps. So all this stuff is good. So the question is how do we put it together? Um, so when I think about robots, the, the the properties that I want to have in the kind of overall control for a robot is. I, I want it to be reasonably general, to be able to face new problems and new domains with different kinds of objects, let's say, adaptable to changes in the environment, and, and robust in the sense, I don't know how to make that formal, but in the sense that it doesn't ever stop, um, so, so, and, or, or just be totally hung up, that it can always figure out something to do. Um, I'm going to talk just very briefly about three robots that I was previously 
hugely involved with. Uh, and then spend most of my time on the thing that I'm working on right now and then talk a little bit about how we're adding learning for a future robot. Um, so back at SRI, so I worked at SRI, the same place that, that Shaky came from, on a robot called Flaky. And let me show you a little, uh, let's see if PowerPoint will do its thing. So here's an example that Flaky did. So here we had somebody spoke to the robot and said, you have a bagel, I want Leslie to have the bagel. Nathan knows where Leslie is, and Nathan is in this room. Okay, so the robot did their purveying of epistemic logic to, to, to figure out that what it needed to do was drive to Nathan's office and ask Nathan where I was, and Nathan said the answer, and then it took the answer and it reasoned about what to do about that, and it drove, uh, and we probably don't need to watch the rest of this in too much detail, but it actually drove to where it needed to go and gave me the bagel. Yeah. So uh, we tried to save the bagel, but it disintegrated. Uh, so I don't have the artifact anymore, that very bagel. Um, so it did a whole bunch of interesting things. What we didn't have, though, was any very good idea of how to manage uncertainty. Um, and uh, the, the, the sort of the, the end of this project was when um, the funding people came to visit for a demo. And there was a new object in the room, which was not in the robot's map. The robot rolled up to the object, asked it to move, and then that was it. There, it couldn't, uh, that, it, so it couldn't adapt to the fact that its map had changed. It was not robust, so, so that was not so good. So it was reasonably general in the sense that there was kind of pretty general purpose reasoning and so on, but it wasn't very adaptable and it wasn't very robust. So my story is that I spent a ton of time on this robot when I showed up at SRI, I didn't know anything about robots, and I spent a ton of time just trying to program it to use its sonars to drive down the hallway reasonably reliably, like a lot of time. And the story went like this. I would write a program for the robot, the robot would crash into the wall. I would go back and think about it, fix the program, and the robot would crash into the wall. I would go back, think about it, fix the program, and the robot would crash into the wall. I'd do this over and over again until the system that was composed of me and the robot learned how to use sonar to navigate, right? The robot and I learned how to use sonar to navigate. And I figured I did not want to be in that loop anymore. So the robot should learn how to use sonar to navigate and leave me out of it. So then I, for my, my, actually my thesis was in reinforcement learning and I actually did a demo with this silly little robot um, for my defense and we did some basic reinforcement learning. So basic reinforcement learning lets you adapt, right? But generally speaking, it's quite narrow. Uh, so good adaptability, some amount of robustness, but, but generally speaking, the systems that people build using reinforcement learning are very general. They are absolutely honed in on solving the particular problem they're presented with. The objective function is built in, uh, and there's not usually much ability to kind of adapt to new open kinds of environments. Um, another robot, more focus on uncertainty now, so building uh, maps, noisy topological maps of environments, using probabilistic reasoning to decide what to do. Probabilistic reasoning really made the system robust. Uh, it was kind of not very general and maybe not so adaptable. Okay, so that's just a little story, a little working on pieces and parts of this problem. So what I've been doing for maybe the last, I don't know, five years or so, in conjunction with Tomaso Zana Perez, is working on this robot called MNM. MNM stands for Mens et Manus, Mind and Hand, which is the MIT motto. And it doesn't involve any learning, but it does involve trying to go from complete low-level reasoning up to moderately high-level reasoning and taking the uncertainty in the problem into account. So let me tell you something about how it works, and I'll come back to this little demo in a little bit. So not so again. Okay, so this is a conversation David and I were having in his office this morning. So let, let's just think about how we think of, how we think about the problem of programming the robot. I think about the problem of programming the robot like this: that ultimately we, the engineers, have to come up with a program that's going to go in the head of the robot, and the program that's going in the head of the robot has to map. Sequences of actions and observations into the next action. No matter what you want to do, that's, I mean, no matter how you want to build the program, that's the form in the end of the program that has to go in there. So it could be a neural network or a giant table or a theorem prover or something, but that's the job. And 
So in all those mappings, which ones do you want? And I would say, well, what we have to think about is, so we want one that in expectation over domains this thing is going to be put in, it should get a lot of reward. And so when we, the engineers, design this program to put in the head of the robot, we should be thinking really, really, really hard about this expectation over environment. Right? So the environment is just one very, it doesn't have much variability in it. Then maybe we can just write the program directly. Or if it, the objective is always easily encoded directly in there, maybe we can use a reinforcement learning program. As the variability over environments gets bigger and bigger, I think that pushes us into different kinds of structures of the program that we end up putting in the head of the robot. So I'm going to talk about a structure that goes in the head of the robot that is built on various kinds of, of inference about what to do at different levels of abstraction and modeling uncertainty. So, uh, so let's go back to the kitchen problem again and kind of think about what makes it hard, what makes me not able to just somehow directly write a program to get the robot to do this job. So the first thing I would say is that the state space is formally enormous. So robotics people like to talk about the number of degrees of freedom in their robot. Okay, so this robot has, I don't know, it's 18 degrees of freedom or something. But that's not the interesting dimensionality of this problem, right? Think about all the objects in the world and their positions and orientations. So that's part of the degrees of freedom of this problem. Think about whether the, the, how the shape of the crumpled ball of foil, or whether the leftovers in that bin there are rotten or not, or how many grapes there are in the refrigerator. Okay. So we, it's not even, it's very hard to even think about what the state space of this domain is. Right? So it's very big, and I would argue, depending on the job you're trying to do at any given moment, you want to take a different view of the state space, but it's not a thing that you can just like very easily put your hands around and characterize. The horizon is, well, possibly not endless, but very long. Uh, most planning approaches are at least exponential in the horizon, uh, how far you have to look ahead. If you think of the robot cleaning this kitchen or making dinner in that kitchen, and you imagine that a primitive step is maybe like a linearly interpolated joint motion, it's really a lot of linearly interpolated joint motions to clean the kitchen. Right? So, And you couldn't reasonably plan that whole sequence. So. How do, you, how do you deal with the sequential problem when the horizon is much too long to actually figure out what to do from the beginning to the end? Um, and then the last problem is that at least I think that, that uncertainty here is pretty much unavoidable. Uh, in some kinds of robotics problems, it's tempting to say, oh, uncertainty, but we just need better sensors. And if we have better sensors, then the uncertainty will go away. But I think that that's fundamentally not the right view. There's uncertainty in this domain that has nothing to do with sensing, right? I don't know what's in that bowl, and I won't know until I lift stuff off and look in it. I don't know how hot the engine is. I don't know when the people are coming home or what they want for dinner. Right? So the uncertainty here is not just failure to have good sensors. It's just the fact that the world is big and complicated, and I only ever have access to a small part of it at any given moment. OK. So these are the three sort of features of this problem that I'm going to concentrate on for right now and talk about an overall kind of architectural, architectural strategy that we've built to address these problems. So it's called VHPN. HPN stands for Hierarchical Planning in the Now. I'll show you later what, what, what I mean that. And the B part is for belief. Um, so let me talk about the space. So you can. A standard decomposition of any machine that has state, uh, right, where the output depends on more than just the current input, is that you can kind of divide it up in this way, where there's a first part that does some kind of state aggregation over time, and a second part that, that computes the output mapping. Um, we'll kind of take a Bayesian view of this and say that what we're going to do is take observations and have some component that does state estimation. So it takes a sequence of observations that the system has gotten the sequence of actions that the system has ever taken, and comes up with a belief state, which you can think of as a probability distribution over possible states of the world. Now, the question of how you represent that is, is important, and I only have, I have some things to say, but I don't know the answer. But the, the view is, we'll, we'll estimate some distribution over 
the state of the world. And then we have an action selection module whose job is to take that distribution of the state of the world and decide what action actors do. So that's the sign. Um, so we can think about these two parts. So let's think first about state estimation. So how do we, how could we represent the robot's beliefs about the state of the world? And it's not actually going to be a database of logical assertions. Um, although we should talk about where that database could somehow come to play in this. But we are committed to there being an open world, right? So we don't necessarily know in advance what objects there are. Our system right now assumes it knows, I mean, the, the thing, particular thing we've implemented assumes it knows the object types, but that we shouldn't have to know that either. So what we do keep is like a database of objects, of, of individuals that we think we have observed in the world, and maybe a distribution over their positions and orientations and other properties that they might have. Um, and we also keep an explicit representation of our belief about free space. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. In traditional robotics, uh, people who do manipulation keep representations of where the objects are. And people who do navigation keep representations of where the matter is not. Because those are the things you need to know in order to do your job. We want to actually move around and pick stuff up, so we need at least both of these things. We also have some other kinds of information, like which objects tend to co-occur nearby which other objects, which we can use for like searching for objects in that. So we have right now kind of an ad hoc belief representation, but it's a really important question. What kinds of representations do you need? How do you aggregate them? How do you add information that you might get, say, from somebody telling you something? So then we have to update this belief based on perceptual information. And there's a long and complicated story, which I am not going to get into because I have way too many things to talk about. But we have to do data association reasoning about whether two objects two instances are the same object or not. Uh, we also do some really pretty interesting reasoning at the interface between the detections of objects and free space. Right? So if I detect this corner of my laptop, I can infer something about what other parts of the space are not free, because I know if this is part of a laptop, then the rest of it is over here somewhere. Similarly, if I see that some piece of space is free, that constrains where objects can be. So those representations can't be kept completely independently. So if somebody wants to talk later about a filtering problem I have, I have one, but I don't want to do it again. Okay. So we have some kind of belief representation. Importantly, it's it's a big it's it's like it's a big mess of numbers. There's a giant covariance matrices and occupancy grids and stuff like that. We do that because we need to keep a reasonably hi-fi representation of what we know about the world so that we can operate in the physical world and not run into things and so on. But we also are going to have to be able to do reasonably reasoning over the long term, kind of abstract reasoning about what actions to take. And so we're actually going to, at this point, integrate logic and geometry with the uncertainty. So let me talk first about how we get the uncertainty and the geometry to play together reasonably well. So in robotics, there are lots of algorithms for solving geometric problems, right? So if I know exactly where obstacles are, I can plan a path to avoid them, let's say. So the question is, how can I, if I have only an uncertain model of where the objects are in my world, or I'm not sure what places are occupied or not, how can I reduce that to a geometric planning problem, which I already kind of really know reasonably well how to solve? So a thing we've been working on is um, constructing what we call shadow worlds. So imagine that I know the shape of an object, and I have some distribution over its pose. So what I can do is actually kind of make, you think of it as like a 95% confidence interval of the space that the table is occupying. Right? So we'll call that the 95% shadow of the table. So if we want to make a path that has reasonably high probability of not colliding, we can build shadows of objects. That, uh, that if we stay out of them, then with high probability, we're not going to be in collision. In fact, we're doing this very approximately, and it's a pretty interesting kind of uh, intersection between computational and geometry and probability, where I could generate a ton of problems if somebody wanted to solve them. What we're doing right now is actually generating more problems, I think, than solving them. It's kind of fun. 
Um, so we're going to, as we go along, you'll see a bunch of pictures that look kind of like this. This is the robot. And it's, it's looking at a desk with some objects on it, and it looks horrible. It's not because we're bad at graphics. It's because we're actually trying to render the shadow to show you the kind of uncertainty and well around the object. So in this case, the robot's more sure. It's still uncertain about where it is. So that's why the robot is kind of fuzzy. OK, so that's a little bit about how we convert uncertainty into a geometry, geometric reasoning problem for dealing with the low-level motion planning. We also use logical reasoning strategies in belief space. And the way we do this is using a kind of an ad hoc probabilistic logic, which has uh, formulas that look like this. So we have, you know, I'm talking about a discrete random variable or about a continuous random variable. So we'll have a, a fluent, a kind of a, a logical form called B something. The first argument is, um, is, is a, it's a, you can think of it as a random variable discrete value random variable, B. So A is on table one. That's a random variable that could be true or false. So I might say, I believe that A is on table one, but that this, this fluid has value true with probability at least 0.9. Or I believe that the support of A, right? So the support of A might be uh, a distribution of our objects in the world, that the support of A is table one with probability at least 0.9. So this is, you could just think of this as a constraint on a probability distribution. Right? It just says, I have some underlying probability distribution. These logical formulas are names for sets of probability distributions. Generally speaking, you can think of logical formulas as names for sets of something, right? sets of, of possible worlds or, or some domain that you're working in. We're going to think of here these logical formulas that we work with as names of sets of distributions. And we're going to reason in the space of sets of probability distributions sets of beliefs that the robot might have about the state of the world. At any given moment, the robot has one particular belief, but we're going to reason in the space of sets of beliefs that the robot might have. That's the space we're planning. Does, so I want to be sure this makes sense, because if I, this doesn't make sense, then things later will not. Yes? Good. The, the, it, so this is subjective belief. So the, the robot has, the robot at any given moment has a belief which, which, about the world. Which is a distribution. Which is a distribution. And that's the distribution of capital P. Is that's right. right. So it's not that P is the distribution. P is a random variable. Over that distribution. Yes. So One of many random variables that that, yeah. Right. That's right. So our fluence will be the names for those random variables. And the robot will have beliefs about those random variables. Right. I don't believe you all get this. Do you? No? I'm speaking such a foreign language, it doesn't make sense. I know you all got it. OK. OK, good. So, so, that's, so that's for discrete random variables. So I can say for discrete random variable, using fancy names for the discrete random variables, right? names that, that kind of get constructed symbolically on the fly depending on domain. Uh, we can, that's an assertion that we can make about what the robot believes. We also have a way to talk about continuous random variables. So in our domain, there's the positions of objects in the world, or the mass of something, or, or, or something like that. Uh, and we um, have a, a, a way of talking about continuous. So if B is a continuous random variable, maybe a multivariate one, like the uh, oppose of an object, then uh, we specify a mean, a standard deviation, a delta, and a PO. That's a lot. And we don't have to understand the whole thing. But roughly, what it means is that, uh, that there's some Gaussian mixture distribution uh, with a mean that's pretty close to mu and a variance which is, and a variance which is less than the sigma, which we believe with probability at least P. So uh, roughly, you can you, you can think about this as saying, if, if you ignore the mixture probability part and imagine that the robot's representation is really all Gaussian distributions, which it isn't necessarily, that's like saying, think of 
the robot's belief space is being characterized by mu and sigma, right? The robot's belief about the position of this thing right now is characterized by mu and sigma. And I want to name a set of possible beliefs the robot could have, and I want to say that set of possible beliefs the robot could have are those beliefs where uh, the mu is not more than d from this m in my uh, in my fluid, right? So the mean is not too far away from this one that I'm specifying, and the variance is less than the variance that I'm specifying. So it's again, it's a constraint on a belief. I can't plan to ask the robot to have a belief with a particular mean, right? That as a goal is not a good goal, right? How could I ask you to to believe that this robot is a, that this object is in a particular pose? I can't. I can't ask you that. I can ask you to believe that the that that this object is within some that the, that the mean of your belief about the object is within some delta of a pose. Okay, so roughly we have constraints of probability distribution. That's the language that we're going to talk. Discrete ones, continuous. And we're in our planning. We're going to treat our uncertainty as factor. So the fact is that the that the joint distribution that the robot has about the positions of itself and all the objects is complicated and correlated and so on. We're going to make an approximation that we use for planning, and the approximation that we use for planning will, generally speaking, factor quite aggressively. So we'll talk about our belief about the pose of this object and our belief about the pose of that object, but we won't reason about the correlations. Okay, so. We have a kind of a raw way of representing our uncertainty about the world in terms of common filters and occupancy goods and stuff like that. We have now a language for describing sets of belief states, and that's the language we use for constructing a planner. What we have to do is figure out how are we going to behave in the world. Our problem is formally a partially observable Markov decision process in a very high dimensional state space that we barely understand there is just it's super computationally intractable to solve it. So we're going to make an approximation which is uh, it, actually it, it's been popular I would say it, it's the approximation that control theory makes in a certain sense which is I'm going to kind of pick an action under the assumption that my model's right, do it, Look to see what happens because, in fact, I know my model's not really right, and then calculate another action to take in response to what happens. Okay. So we're going to plan with a very approximate model, take the first step, execute it in the world, make an observation, see what happened, and then replan. So that's going to be our strategy. It is not a good way to do things when the downside risk of your action choices could be very bad. It's not a good way to run a nuclear reactor. Uh, it's probably an okay way to do kind of general household manipulation. Although maybe not. And so that's another thing that we talk about at some point. But this is the, the position that we're taking. So that means, from the perspective of the planner, the thing that has to select action, all the rest of this is what the control theorists would call the plant. Right? So, so I get to set up a planning problem where my goal is in belief space, right? My goals, every time I specify a goal for this robot, it's going to be described in belief space. I'm going to say, please believe that you're in the kitchen or that this object has been put away or whatever. I cannot specify goals for the robot in state space because the robot can't ever know whether they're true in state space. So my belief, my goals are articulated in belief space and the robot has access to its current belief. So it's going to make plans in the space of beliefs about what's going on in the world. Plans in the space of probability distribution. And so from that perspective, the dynamics of the world are really the dynamics of the belief update. Right? So the robot's going to take an action. The action is going to affect the environment, which is going to generate an observation, which is going to go through the state estimator, which is going to generate a new belief state. And those are the dynamics, the transition model that the planner has to use to reason about the effects of its actions. Okay. So how do we construct the planner? We are going, because, because we want to use it hierarchically and also for some other reasons, which I, again I could explain 
afterwards. I'll explain what we do. So we are going to do use a technique called uh, that AI people call it lower regression. It's really unfortunate because we do regression and another kind of machine learning regression too. So too much regression. Uh, robotics people call it pre-ridge back chaining, which is better because at least it doesn't collide with the name regression. Um, but it's instead of searching, so, so generally speaking, when you plan, you can search forward typically in the state space. In our case, if we were going to do a forward search, it would be a forward search in the space of beliefs. Instead, we're going to do a backward search. And when we do a backward search, it's in the space of goal. It's in the space of sets of belief states. So the way it works is we start out with a goal. Uh, so the goal, you can do the goal is some specification. Like, I believe this object is within this region with high vulnerability. Maybe that's my goal. Um, and now what I'm going to do is reason back. So, And I know my initial belief. So here's my initial belief. And here's a set of belief states I wish I was in. And now I can ask for any given action that I could take. If that were to be the last step of, of my plan, what would have to be true so that if I were to take that action, I would end up in the goal? So that's the pre-image. So the pre-image, the terminology is the pre-image of the goal under this action is the set of belief states such that if I were to take that action, I would end up in one of the belief states in the goal. So we're going to construct our search backwards in this space of sets of beliefs. And you just keep going backwards. Each time the, a state in our search is a set of belief states. And finally, the search terminates when you hit a set of beliefs that contains your current belief. Because then you know that if you were to take action two followed by action one, you would end up in the goal. Right. Let me illustrate this with an example. Imagine that we had a really simple domain. The simple domain is uh, the robot wants this object to be in location one. And if there's three discrete locations, the robot can move this object and it can look. So we can actually describe the dynamics of the, the belief space dynamics of this domain using moderately standard looking planning operator notation. So we can say, imagine, so th let's think about the action of moving. So moving an object O to a target location. The result of this action, we would like we would like the result to be that we believe that the location of this object is the target location with some probability at least p. And I have a free variable, which is a starting location, which I'll have to pick somehow. But I can say that if I believe that the object is in the starting location with some other probability, then after I take this action, I will believe it's in this location with at least probability p. Right? And so if moving the object has has a probability of failure, then I'll have to believe with higher probability the object is in the starting location so that after moving it, I will believe that it's in the resulting location with, with a somewhat lower probability. So this is a little kind of Bayes rule calculation. Does that make sense? So, so I, can, I can make a plan like this. I also have operations for looking. So I can say, uh, and, and looking is interesting. And so I can, I can say, imagine that I want to believe that the object is in location uh, L with some probability at least P. Another way I could achieve that is by looking at that location. Now, this operator is articulated optimistically. I'll explain in a minute about that. So I'll say, well, if I used to believe it was in location L and I see it, that's not written here. If I used to believe it was in location L with some lower probability, and I look there and I see it, then afterwards I'll believe it's there with a higher probability. Right? That's like I'm looking to verify. Now, the problem is I might not see it. Right? So this is not a deterministic operation. So what we do is actually we make a deterministic approximation of the dynamics, make a plan under that deterministic approximation, take the first step, see how we do, and so on, and replan if it doesn't come out the way we expect it. So here what we're doing is actually we're going to assume optimistically that we see the object when we look for it. But we force ourselves to pay a cost that's related to the negative log likelihood of actually seeing the object there. 
So that means I could include in my plan the operation of looking in my pocket and finding a million dollars. But that would have a cost that was like minus log probability of there being a million dollars in my pocket. So I won't make that plan. So we're gonna make we're gonna make a deterministic approximation, but we're gonna charge ourselves a lot for hallucinating unlikely things. Uh, and that will give us a plan through belief space that has high probability of succeeding. Um, I'm gonna skip this part. Okay. So we have a way of converting uncertainty into geometry. We have a way of dealing with uncertainty at higher levels using reasoning about sets of belief states. I'm going to talk about hierarchy, and then I'm going to try to show you this in an example so you get an idea of what's going on. So the way we deal with a long horizon is by a hierarchical planning model. And there's a lot of work, if you look at AI planning literature, on hierarchical planning, but it's all about using hierarchy to derive a complete plan at the lowest level of abstraction. And I want to argue that a complete plan at the lowest level of abstraction is a ridiculous thing to want, especially when there's uncertainty. So like I flew to Chicago yesterday, uh, and I took it on faith that I would be able to walk through the Chicago airport. Um, I couldn't make a plan in advance for walking through the Chicago airport because I didn't know where, what gate I was going to come into or the map or which slow people were going to be in front of me when I was trying to walk down the hallway. I didn't know any of that. So I could not have made a plan to walk through the airport. I had to have a model at some reasonably high level of abstraction that told me, well, at least probably I would succeed, probably it wouldn't cost me more than you know, $20, probably it wouldn't take more than 10 minutes, I don't know, there's something, maybe more than 10 minutes. So that's a model of that, a prior before coming in, that allowed me to make an abstract plan for coming here that didn't involve working out in detail how to walk through the airport. So can we make that intuition concrete here? So, um, what we're going to do is do planning and execution mixed together, and we're never going to have a complete plan. So what we'll do is we have some high-level goal in belief space, and we make a plan at some level of abstraction. So ignoring some of the details of the operations. And a plan, because we're doing that backward chaining style of planning, a plan for us comes with a bunch of pre-images, right? So I say, here was my goal, here's the, the operator that I think would get me to the goal, and here's the pre-image of that operation, pre-image of the goal under that operation. So these blue boxes represent sets of belief states that we think we're gonna go through in order to get to the final goal. And remember, the reason for using logic again is because the sets can be really big. I mean, they're infinite, right? So when I say my goal, my goal is to be at my hotel in Chicago. I'm just constraining a couple of variables, right? It doesn't have anything to do with where you guys were last night. You were somewhere. You were part of the state. You're potentially part of my belief space. But I, didn't, I just didn't have to name where you were last night. I just had to name where I was. That was really all I was worried about. So state space is really big, but the, the, the constraint that I want to put on it is not so complicated. Okay. So after we make the plan at this level of abstraction, we have a bunch of stuff. So this thing is the set of states that has to be true right now so that doing this plan will succeed. And I believe I'm in that set. And so this next, this next thing here is that, is that you can think of it as a set of It's now the first target blob of state, of belief states that I would like to get into. And so what we do now is we make a plan just for reaching this subset, but we make it with more detail. And that gives me a new plan at this level of abstraction. And then we take this as a target and plan for that. Until we get down to having some primitives, when we hit primitive action, we execute it. If we execute it and we ended up in this blob, which is where we thought we were going to end up, we're happy and we go on with this plan. If when we execute this action, we don't end up here, then we replan. We just pop this level off the stack. And then if we pop this off and we think we're here, we ask to see if, if, or actually we're trying to get here, we ask to see if we're still in the pre-image of the planet at this level, and if we're not, we pop that off the stack, and so on. So we don't actually have to re-examine our plans completely. You don't have to re-address your commitment to doing a PhD when you miss the bus. 
Maybe you do. If you did, it would not be a very computationally feasible strategy. Yep. So how do you connect to the correct release to me? That seems like the hard part. Well, so this, so each of these G's is basically a list of constraints on the current belief. I believe the object is within this region. I believe the robot is here. But at the bottom of the tree, you have your current field, your belief at time zero. The belief at time zero is a member of this set. So this G, this G1 here is a set, and my current belief is in that set. It seems difficult for me to solve for the action that induces that change from belief at time zero to the sub goal of G1. Um, we just do like strips like planning using those operators to, to make a plan at each of these levels. So if I need to, if I want the object to be here, either it's going to be there because I, my last action was that I put it there, or I looked and verified. And then what's the precondition? Well, it's that it was in my hand. Well, how am I going to get it in my hand? Well, I have to figure out. So that's that's the planning. Yep. How do you decide what each level of abstraction is? Yeah. So um, I have a, a slide about that. So right now it's it's unfortunately manual and it should be learned so one of the things that we did when we set out kind of to do this work is to figure out what all of the things that we need to learn because i believe fairly strongly that we have to build in some amount of architectural constraint and we have to do some learning and so what we did here was kind of tried to build the architectural constraint and think about where the learning would go but um so it doesn't try to learn about what the this system that I'm going to show you right now has zero learning in it. Like, zero. I mean, many of my students are working on learning. This isn't me and Tomas, the old geezers, trying to think about the bigger question in a certain sense. And we're the learning things. The answer to how we decide, how do we make abstract operations, I'm not going to go into this in detail because it would kind of take me too long, but the, this is an old idea from Earl Sashadati, who was one of the people who worked on JP is that if you have a planning theory that says, for instance, uh, I mean, my, my example, a better example of this one is, you know, when I'm planning to drive somewhere, at first I can make a plan without thinking about gasoline. I get a basic plan. And then I might realize that I actually have to have enough gas to make this leg. And then I, I can add in extra steps that will deal with those extra preconditions. So by leaving off some preconditions of your actions, Temporarily postponing thinking about them, you can build a hierarchy pretty nicely. So that's that's our strategy for building a hierarchy. Uh, but I, I, I guess mm -hmm. what I'm thinking is that you don't have to think about like the mechanics of gas burning in the car engine. Yes. You know, the relevant thing is oh, how do we? Happen. So how would you ever acquire an abstract an abstract theory at that level? Good. I'll I'll show you an example. Some learning is actually in the talk, if not in the system. Okay. So. Now I'm going to show you an example of this robot doing its thing, and then we can talk a little bit about how we acquire some stuff, how we could acquire some stuff, but this thing doesn't have. So here's a problem. Uh, it's a pretty simple problem. The, the, the robot is standing facing a table, and there's a blue box, which is called soda, because it's a baking soda box. So it's a little confusing. It's called soda. It's blue because it was leaking, and they covered it in shape. And we have strategically placed a nefarious soup can in front of the blue box. The robot doesn't know that the soup can exists. It knows about soup cans in general, but it doesn't know that soup can exists. And its job is to get the blue box and put it over on somewhere on the left side of the table. So the high level goal we gave it was to believe that the soda is in the target region with probability at least 0.95. And it came up with a plan. It planned its highest level plan, the highest level of abstraction is to place the object down and to look at it, right? Because placing is pretty uncertain. So it says, if I were to just place it, I couldn't believe you know, uh, with high enough confidence that the object was where it needed to be. So I'm going to look at it. So I'm going to put it down and I'm going to look at it. That's my plan. And then it decomposes this at different levels of abstraction and eventually decides that what it needs to do is get a look at the soda and figure out where it is before it can do anything else. So it thinks about where could it stand to get a view of it if it were at its mean pose. So here's the initial state. The robot moves over, takes a look, detects the objects, 
it still has some uncertainty about where they are, but I have a better idea. Okay, now it, in the process of doing this, it discovered the nefarious soup can. So now it has to deal with that. So here it is. It comes over, it takes a look. Yeah. Okay, this is a complicated plan. You can't possibly like interpret it at all, but it goes like this. It knows, because we told it, that in order to move through space, there needs to be nothing in that space. Uh, and so this blue blob is its it's swept volume. It says, if I were to try to pick up that blue box, here's the region of space that would have to be clear so that I could do that. So that's, it says, okay, I need to believe that that space is clear. This is, oh no, but I don't believe that space is clear right now. In fact, I believe there's a soup can in there. So I'm going to have to move the soup can out of the way. So Whatever it found, if it was just uncertain, it would look to dispel the uncertainty. If it found six objects in there, it would say, I have to get all six objects out of here. So it does a pretty general purpose reasoning about what it needs to do in order to make this condition true so that it can go and pick up the blue thing. So it comes up here, uh, it moves up, it's about ready to pick up the soup can, all that stuff is planning about soup can. Uh, and then it says, oh dear, I, there's a lot of uncertainty in its base motion. So now it's not so sure where it is with respect to the table or the or the can. So it says, I need to know where that can is with higher likelihood before I try to pick it up. So, and then it says, oh darn, my hand's in the way. So it has to move its hand out of the way to get a look. And now it gets a better estimate of where the object is. So there it is. Comes over here. Needs to be ready to pick up soup can. Where's its hand out of the way? Now this is suboptimal, right? When you mean everything, I mean, so much suboptimal. Much so much. Uh, but one thing is, whenever you introduce a hierarchical decomposition, you lose the ability to kind of optimize over the boundaries in a very nice way. So sometimes I'm annoyed about the fact that the robot will like pick something up, intend to put it here, realize that the water bottle's in the way, have to put this down, move the water bottle, pick this up, and put it back down here. And then I watch myself do things around the house sometimes, and I do occasionally make suboptimal actions against this. I don't know if you do, but. Um, uh, it could be that that's the price we pay for some amount of computational tractability. Uh, okay, so now it's going to pick up the object, put it down over here on the table. So, uh, it's going to pick up the object. Go over here. Also, not optimal Martian timing. A lot of this stuff could be better. We just are picking our dots. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the rest of this, but at this point now, it figures out that it has to pick up the blue box, move it over, etc. Alright. So, if you had wanted a robot that could pick up a blue box and put it on the left hand side of the table, this would not be the program that you should write. Right? So it's kind of slow, it's going to do a bunch of stuff about it. But it's pretty general purpose. So now I want to show you some other stuff that that same code can do. Right? So in this case, the, uh, it wants the, the green box to be over on the end of the table. The green box is too big to pick up. It knows it can't pick it up. It has to push it. But So it has to move the orange one out of the way so I can push the green one. And then the green one, it tried to push it, but it didn't go far enough because some torque thing was not working quite right. But it's okay. It, it looks and it replans and says, man, I didn't push it far enough. Let me push it again. So the fact that it looks and replans gives it a kind of robustness. This is also the same code. So in this case, we ask the robot to go out of the room. It doesn't know, it knows about chairs, but it doesn't know those are there. It says the same thing. I need the space to be free in order to go out of the room. Let me look and see, verify the space is free. Oh no, there are chairs in the way. Okay, in order to get out of the room, I'm going to have to figure out what to do about these chairs. So it's going to grab those chairs and move them out of the room. So to an AI person, this doesn't seem like a ton of generality. To a robotics person, this is a, it's a surprising amount of generality in this program that can do roughly all these kinds of things. All right, I think I now have about 10 minutes. And so what I want to do is if there are questions about this particular thing, I will take them. Otherwise, I'll talk about what. This is kind of a learning oriented crowd. So, pretty much now everybody is a learning person. So, okay. So, I'll talk about learning. So, we got this super cool new robot. I'm just using it as an excuse to talk about a new 
a new world. Uh, so uh, there's just, and she's now walking a bit. Russ Tedrick is making it walk. Once, once I can walk, then we'll do some other questions. Okay. So what do we think about how to actually design a system, right, to make a nice robust robot that's generally intelligent? Like, needs to do a bunch of things. I think we can build in some fundamental algorithms that are kind of domain independent, reasoning algorithms like the planner and the calm and filter, and then try to learn the rest. So what's the rest? Well, in perception, we understand learning, right? There's like learning object detectors, learning primitive policies. That's most robot learning, actually, I would say, falls, falls in that category. There's also learning observation and transition models at reasonably high levels of abstraction. So let me show you an example of that. That's actually from several years ago. Um, so we tried to learn a model of this robot picking up objects and moving them around. Now, uh, it's a simulator, which is actually not a very good simulator, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and it sort of tries to pick up an object and put it somewhere. Um, and what we did was we gave the learning algorithm a vocabulary that it could use, basically on. And it, from experience, learned an abstract, probabilistic model of the dynamics of this world. So uh, let me actually skip the details. But we let it invent its own concepts. We let it come up with new symbols that would make its theory more compact. So it quote unquote invented all these things. It, it had to pay a, pay a price in the regularizer for inventing a new vocabulary item, but it was worth it if it paid off. Right? So uh, there's nothing, something's in my hand, nothing's in my hand, an object is clear, an object is above Y, so that's a transitive closure. So it had a bunch of, of different operations it could perform. And so it ended up learning rules like this, like uh, roughly picking up middle-sized blocks usually succeeds. I can't pick up really big blocks. Uh, if a tiny block is on another block and something happens, then something happens. So this gets at your question because in some sense, inside the simulator, embedded in its differential equations of the dynamics of the world is a perfectly good forward predictive model of the physics of that world. But I don't know how to do planning at a high level with that model. So here we learn a probabilistic model. We sweep a bunch of the geometric details under the rug into the uncertainty of the rules. And we plan using this probabilistic model. So this is a, a hint of an idea of how you might learn abstract models of the dynamics, which are not as predictive as they could be but they let you do planning more efficiently. Um, another thing that we're doing now, this is like stuff Tomas and I did over the summer, um, is to try to learn the pre-images of actions. So imagine somebody who does really good robot learning figured out how to push an object reliably or do an insertion of a key into a keyhole or pour. If we want to take one of those operations and integrate it into our planning system, we need to know the pre-image. We need to know the conditions under which that action will achieve its goal. So I have a tiny rant to insert here about like end-to-end -end robot learning. So a lot of people are working on sort of deep networks for learning a particular job for a robot, mapping images to the ability to hang a coat hanger on a rack. But no one wants a robot that can hang coat hangers only. We want a robot that can learn many skills and compose them in a useful way. So what happens here is if we get a new primitive for pushing an object, and we can learn the pre-image, we can learn where the robot's hand has to be with respect to the object in order to get it into a region, for instance, then we can use that primitive in context. We can use everything we already know about the kinematics of the robot, about when to look at things to reduce uncertainty. We can use the fact that sometimes you have to move an object out of the way in order to push the original object somewhere, because robot's moving its head too much, and the motion plans aren't great. But so I think we need to, when we think about learning, we need to think about modularity, about being able to learn individual pieces to characterize their preconditions and effects, and to understand how they can play a role in a more complicated architecture. Um, 
There's a bunch of details here which I can't talk about, and also experiments the age and the curve that goes up. Okay, another point about learning. So all the learning I've talked about so far is really learning about the effects of the robot's actions in the world. But there's another kind of learning that's at least as important, which sometimes gets called analytic learning, or learning to reason. It's the kind of learning you do when you learn to play chess. If I tell you the rules for chess, you know information theoretically. You know everything there is to know. Right? It's just the reasoning problem now. But yet, people learn to play chess, and one argument is that that learning is learning search control for your reasoner, or learning new abstract models of how to characterize a position. So we might learn better samplers for the state estimator. We might learn an attention strategy for state estimation, so we can pay attention only to certain parts of what's going on. We might learn uh, the controller learning is often gradient descent. Maybe we can learn ways of initializing controller learning. We definitely need better ways of sampling actions in the planner, learning search heuristics, learning how to do a hierarchical decomposition. So I think uh, we have all kinds of really interesting and important opportunities for learning, but I want to think about the role they play in a bigger architecture. Um, and yeah, this is all the stuff Here we are. So some past robots, a present robot that you saw some videos of, our current robot that we're working on, trying to integrate learning with all this other planning and estimation stuff. Uh, and we hope that eventually we'll be able to hit all these goals and the robot will show up and tell us to clean our own mess for us. But anyway, so I will uh, say thank you and give you a robot to watch. Okay, so uh, thanks. a lot of ground fairly quickly, taking any questions you'd like. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the scripts, how they allow people to get the scripts. Um, but in model world, there's a set of blocks of statements, what's up, what? Mm -hmm. That actually can be interpreted as a set of belief states. Like it's the set of belief states yes. where I have strong belief that these statements is true. Yes. Logical representations represent uncertainty as a set. I mean, it, right? Uh, uh, the model. Well, you could give a probabilistic condition, but you'd then have to say what the probabilities are, right? I mean, right. So. Well, I can just say that my odd statement means probability. You could, you could, but I actually want to reason about the probabilities too. I want to manipulate the probabilities in my. So I need to expose them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe related to uh, a little bit to you could mention end to end learning. Mm -hmm. But um, it, so the approach you, you described here is a very uh, sort of, uh, logical approach of uh, in building a, a model and then planning based on that model. Mm -hmm. And the other extreme is an approach of uh, just building a, a map of like this is currently what I observe and it's going to do something. Absolutely. And and this is how so if you think of, of the bigger robots that are now very uh, uh, we're going into, which is cars. Mm -hmm. This is to a large extent how much of the self-driving cars is mm -hmm. working. There's, mm -hmm. there's very little modeling of right. the cars. Right. And wondering if you can have so do you think there's a so two questions here. One, do you think there's some of the reason which one is more important than the other? Or can you combine them in some way and have, have in your blog yeah. both the model coming and just some immediate impulse of Sure. Reflex or reaction or something. Yeah. Uh, right. So 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 good. I think that that's a that's a really good question. And I think the most critical thing is to not be dogmatic and to be computer scientists when we think about these things. So my sense is that driving is not a super. I, I mean, and I don't know how to make this formal, but I would argue that the driving is not as high dimensional or high variance as that kitchen. Like, there's a lot of things that can happen, but really. The set of things that can happen is not so big, and your set of control actions is actually not that big. So driving is hard, and it's scary, and it's fast, and it has
has a bunch of constraints that mean you have to be able to link up actions very quickly. But it also means that probably the depth of reasoning required to come up with a good reaction to something that happens is not super deep. Right? If I have to solve a total thing problem to decide which way to turn, I'm screwed. Right? Okay, so there are problems where the time constraints, the time constraints are high, and I think the variation and the the variability in the domain means that we have a hope of writing a policy down a priori, either learning it or coding it. On the other hand, if you think of traveling to Chicago and all the things that could happen, I don't think that it's reasonable to imagine anticipating in any sense all those situations and having a reaction for them at hand. So I think we want to do planning and search and online optimization in domains that are really big, where we can't reasonably a priori figure out what to do in all those cases. So I don't think that there's any like hard distinction, and that there's many different kinds of problems that, that show up at different levels of abstraction. In our work, our primitives, our lowest levels, are packaged up tight loop policies, like driving. And those are reasoned about at a higher level, like should I do this one or should I do that one? Or what parameters should I pass to this one? So they, 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 they have to figure out a way to make those things play together. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Snake weapon? 